looks like we're now streaming live. All right. So. Hello and welcome, one, everyone. One second. Okay. It's still signing in. Okay. You you give us the thumbs up and then you can even use the little reaction. Oh, we are all set. We are all set. Go ahead. All right. Hello and welcome, everyone. You're attending or listening to a special episode of Enemies of the State Live, brought to you by the Small Press Expo and your friends at Field Mouse Press. I'm Alex Hoffman, the publisher of Solrad. Daniel Lelkin, editor of Solrad. I'm Sarah Miller from The Sequentialist. I'm Jules Bakes, freelance critic. And I'm Rob Cloud, contributing editor of Solrad. If you've never listened to the show, we want to welcome you and hope you'll stick around with us after this panel. Enemies of the State is a monthly book club podcast featuring a rotating cast of comics critics published by Solrad, the online literary magazine for comics, available on online at solrad.co or S-O-L-R-A-D dot C-O. This month, we're talking about Dancing After 10 by Vivian Chong and Georgia Weber. Dancing After 10 is a graphic memoir of Chong's life before and after developing toxic epidermal necrolysis, abbreviated as 10, which is the source of the book's title. This is an extraordinarily rare and deadly inflammatory skin reaction that causes severe skin shedding and the formation of scar tissue all over your body. The growth of the scar tissue leaves Chong blind and also causes hearing loss. Chong receives a cornea transplant that briefly allows her sight again, and during that time she drew 100 pages of this memoir, which were then incorporated into a full narrative with the help of illustrator and cartoonist Georgia Weber, well known for her own comics about chronic health issues. Through the movement of the memoir, we see Chong suffer both physically and mentally as she deals with the debilitating disease and its aftermath. Over time, Chong comes to a radical acceptance of the changes in her life, and, gro and the growth of her artistic output culminates in a dance production that coincided with the release of this book from Fanagraphics in 2020. I wanted to start our conversation today about Dancing After 10 with the idea of um, just briefly talking about um, graphic, um, graphic medicine and the use of memoir and uh, in a sort of almost didactic way to kind of tell a story about a disease and, and how it affects a life. Well, Any, go ahead, Rob. Yeah, I was just going to say graphic memoir or um, graphic medicine is something I've been following since its inception um, when it was more or less invented by um, a physician in England and <clears throat> who used on the plume Tom Ferrier and he wrote about his experiences as a, as a primary physician in England which is a very diff different experience in England than in America for a number of reasons um, but it's been a fascinating thing to read because the range of these true stories has as you alluded to been very different depending on the project um, the more the less successful projects I have found are the ones that tend to be more didactic, um, and that tend to put um, kind of a false, kind of kind of slapping on uh, the hero's narrative onto the narrative of disease, um, and. Whereas the experience of having a serious disease is just simply a human experience with positives and negatives. And um, uh, the, the best I can think of, the best two I can think of, especially with uh, cancer narratives, which are very common. And in my experience, most of them aren't very good. Um, the best is our, uh, our Cancer Year by Harvey P. Carr and Joyce Bradner and uh, Cancer Made Me a Shallower Person by Miriam Engelberg. And both of them are really powerful in part because they reveal kind of warts and all the experience, not only the experience of going through having a debilitating disease, but also the experience of what it's like to be a caretaker for this person with debilitating disease and uh, how difficult it is and how, um, uh, how, how often the interactions that they're experiencing are not heroic. They're small and petty 
I'm angry. And the bringing this round to Vivian Chong's book, uh, it's an interesting work because all of these themes are kind of mashed together in different ways from uh, this kind of authentic experience of this debilitating disease to uh, the reaction of the caretakers around her um, and the experience that she has with them. And then finally, the way it's eventually framed uh, is perhaps more heroic uh, than maybe she intended or she chose to turn what was horrible pain into a hero's journey. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. I, you know, I think we you often think about, or maybe the 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 human reflex is to tell stories using that the you know that is it Campbell's journey of the hero and like, and you can definitely see some of that in this book, right? You can definitely. Um, I'm not sure that I completely buy the the idea uh, as Chong as a hero um, or, you know, using that framework. But I think, you know, you could slot this book into that framework fairly easily if you wanted to. And I know Daniel and I talked about that at length at one point. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, Daniel, what um, what's your thought on on this book as a hero's journey or does that ring true to you or does that make sense i i i see rob's point real clearly and i <clears throat> i i guess i'm the thing that i struggle with with this book is that it's so em emotionally powerful at the beginning of this book uh the rawness of both the art comes art and um the story and the, just the internal monologue that that uh, is presented, as well as our interactions with the uh, supporting characters, is is just uh, when I when I sat down to read this book the first time, I was just like I pulled back as much as uh, I was drawn in, uh, and then I found that as uh, it progressed and there was acceptance and healing, that it lost a lot of that emotional intensity for me. And, I, you know, I, I don't feel that I'm in a place to really make large statements about it, but I, I felt it was almost uh, like a platitude at the end and that it was performative at the end. And it kind of disappointed me more than anything else. I think your use of the word performative is really interesting because that platitude that you're talking about, um, gosh, what, what was the actual phrasing? It, it was something that belonged on a bumper sticker. Which... Yeah, she says, you can't add more time to your life, but you can add more life to your time. I, I think it's interesting that it, it's framed as being delivered in the context of her performance, right? She's on stage, she's got her ukulele, she's being a little cutesy about it, and it, it isn't necessarily what she really thinks. It isn't really necessarily what she's really experiencing. She is putting on a performance quite literally, right? But, but who's the audience then? I mean, it's us. It, yeah. She's talking to us. So, so what, I'm trying to figure out exactly what the purpose of that performance is then. Hmm. I think, and there's a, uh, there's a kind of a narrative at the end of the book where she kind of talks about the, the goals of, of creating this thing. And one of the things that um, she notes is that this was a, a gift, I believe, to her friends who keep on asking about her sight or about her journey. Um, so it's a gift to the sighted, I guess, if you will. But, so, so was I was I alone though in in feeling that that the end kind of sort of undermines the intensity of the whole book? No, not at all. I think I'm, I'm with you on that. I think there's, I, I guess, if you want to say by the end, you mean the last two pages and those two pages only, because I think you definitely have a good point there, right? For me, I think the most emotional part of the work is actually the free form drawing that she does at the end, at the very end of the book. It's very, it's very, um, 
I guess, just led by the id, led by the, you know, the more, you know, um, subconscious kind of, of freehand motion or just, you know, drawing her senses or drawing her feelings on the page without sight, you know, and so how Weber integrates that and how Chong kind of, how they play off of each other at the, at the very end end of the book actually i felt that to be the most that's the emotional zenith of the book to me um and there's some very powerful drawing in the end of the book but those last two pages do kind of pull you back away from the narrative and pull you back away from her as a person it's like um you get close but not too close come come and come and experience my life but not not too close not don't don't get near me see what i have seen feel what i have felt but do not get too close which i think is it's a weird it's a weird um juxtaposition with the rest of the book right which is so open and so brutal um and it's and it's honesty and i think you know on, i use the word honesty in in the way that you use honesty when talking about graphic memoir which is to say as you know poorly as a, a bad critical response to a work but I think it's it's emotionally resonant and it um, and it feels it feels like she's being very open with us as the as the reader the author and the reader um, but at the end there it's, it's like almost I don't know if this is a great metaphor but it's like or a simile I guess but it's like the door being closed shut in your face well to agree it's all it is a little reminder saying, look at all this open and raw stuff I did, but remember readers, this is my show. Uh, and it's almost a little reminder of that, no matter how raw and real I seem to be getting with you, as you say, um, it's a show. And I don't know if that's intentional or if simply she felt that the best way to cap off the book was to cap it off with the thing that she was most proud of which were these live performances that she was trying to give the reader a taste of. And, um, and I think the problem is that the, we as the reader cannot experience the experience of going to one of her live performances. We weren't there. We don't know what it was like. We don't know to what degree, how immersive it was and um, what kind of narrative she was truly giving in that performance because she only gives a taste of what that was like in the comic. And that clashes with tonally with everything else she'd done in the book up to that point, which was just like, um, it's not just that it was raw, it's not just that it was open, but it was literally this account of like this desperation in comics form of her desperately trying to write down her experience while she could still see. And yes, le leading and and even narratively, the way that she organized it was interesting because the book starts off uh, in media res where we don't know quite what's going on. We know she's sick. She knows she's someone who is like supposedly a caretaker, but seems to be a very um, unreliable one. And then, and then only then do we get filled in with this backstory, um, you know, leading back to this, what would seem to be a narratively triumphant moment of her, oh, I've got my sight back, you know, I, you know, and, and, you know, kind of loops around in the beginning and it's like, but no, I, this isn't really happy ending. Instead, things get much, 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 much worse. So do you think framing that last shot as a performance is maybe a reminder to the audience that no matter how much we think we know at this point, about what she went through, we're still watching a performance. Like no matter how close we feel to that experience, we still are on the other side of a wall. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really interesting question, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because I mean, she does pull you in so much at the beginning of this book, and you are right there with her, feeling what she's feeling, and then to sort of put up that wall, it's, it's a really interesting choice. And so, uh, yeah, maybe maybe there's a, a statement there as well that just because you think you understand, you're not 
going to understand. Exactly. Hmm. What do you think, Sarah? We haven't had a chance to let you talk yet. I'm, uh, we initially recorded a version of this show and I completely botched it. And so I lost all the audio. And so we've had, you know, part of it, we've had part of this discussion before. So I'm really interested because Sarah was prepped for the show, but couldn't make it. So we wanted to, to have you on. And what do you, what are your, what are your initial thoughts about um, Dancing After 10? Well, going to, um, what everyone's been saying about how the end is such a shift, I, it makes me think, you know, the, the intensity of the experience can't last forever for her either. Like she, she does move into a new normal. I mean, if you can call it that. And I think showing that at the end of the book, kind of bringing it down as a reminder to everyone, you know, this was something she went through and will continue to go through, but you you kind of can't be in a state of constant crisis forever. And having, I'm not sure I really like the platitude, especially the enjoy the ride, because it's hard to imagine enjoying an experience like what she went through um, seems a little, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, trite, but, I do like how it's it's a reminder that, you know, things are gonna keep going on even if they're not like they were before, which is kind of trite in itself as well to say. But uh, I, I like the way the intensity kind of ramped down at the end. I think one of the, I guess your point is, is crystallizes something for me in the sense that it's um, her saying, this is a thing that happened to me, but it doesn't define me. Yeah, completely. Yeah. I think there's also an aspect maybe, and again, for a book as open as it is in many ways, um, and talking about wanting to give a gift to sighted friends and sort of said, this is my experience. Uh, it's hard to suss out a lot of author intent here. Um, because as Alex points out, there's this um, shifting open and closed quality to it. But maybe one part of it is simply that like, I, I, I talk about a lot of suffering, but I refuse to let the f note of this be suffering porn, basically. Um, and that's, you know, for so many narratives of marginalized people, that's what a lot of people kind of expect and even want in those sort of narratives so, you know, she really seems to definitively like stick a middle finger to that idea as well, yeah. even if in doing so, it's it's a dissonant note. I mean, a lot of this book is about trying to regain control. And so maybe that this is one way where she at the end says, I've got it, I've got control now. Or she's exerting her control over you as the reader, right? Like that not only not only do I have control, I have control over your experience as my audience. You know, and so and obviously every author has that, right? But the deliberateness in which they talk about or use that control, um, I, I guess in this case, it's not so much that it's deliberate, but it's that it's intentionally visible. Right, like that most of the time the author is not making their control over your experience intently visible, right? So she is certainly doing that in this case. The effect is that, you know, it's like, here's all this horrible stuff. Here's some of the ways I came back from it. And, uh, but don't feel bad reader. It's like, it's like putting a bandaid on someone who's on fire. That's definitely a way to put it. I, you know, it's, there's a, there's a, there is that quality to this work where it is, it's kind of, it's kind of overwhelming in that, in the kind of sheer terror of it sometimes. And, and we've, we focused a lot on the ending because I think we've, we all, I think can agree that the beginning is such an emotionally resonant and kind of complex experience. It's very, um, 
is very heartrending in certain ways and, and very difficult to read. I think I think that goes to something that Rob said earlier about the uh, that's the expectation in a book like this is that we see that experience and we try and understand um, what the what the author is is living through through their art. Um, I, I really like what you said at the end there, though, Rob, about how she kind of turns that on us a little bit. And it makes me think a little bit more about my, my reading at the end of this book. I wanted to, since it seems like this is a good place to kind of bring in another idea, I wanted to kind of go back to this um, the way that this graphic novel is set up, the collaboration between Chong and Georgia Weber, who's a well-known cartoonist whose own work, um, Dumb, talks about her issues with chronic disease and the loss of her voice. Um, and I wanted to kind of talk about how you felt that the work, uh, like visually and maybe emotionally to a certain extent, how this work kind of is tied together. Because one of the things I find most fascinating about this work is the, is the drawing that Chong did in that two week period that gets incorporated into the work, right? The, all of these, they're, it's very sketchy, it's very uh, loose and fast, and it, and it feels like I'm just like trying to get as much done as I possibly can with the time that I have. Um, and so having that integrated into this fuller work, I wanted to get everyone's thoughts on that. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff to read into um, what, what you were saying earlier about control. I, I think a lot of that is reflected in an interesting way um, by sort of the ratio of collaboration as the book goes on, like um, where it starts with, um, it starts as fully George's work uh, as far as the artwork is concerned, um, then it moves on into uh, Vivian's sort of hectic, very uh, almost panicked lines while she's trying to get things down as she's losing her sight. And then I, I, I think you see the book move on again into Georgia's work as Vivian starts to acclimate to um, asking for help. And, and then at the end, those pages that you were talking about, Alex, those very loose, abstract, freeform, much less panicky, um, much more evocative drawings that Vivian produces as she's kind of like lost that sense of panic. Um, I, I, I think you can see her uh, journey through her relationship with control um, through the, the way the book um, the way the book represents her experience by way of her drawings versus George's and hers with sight versus hers in her new normal right yeah I, I completely agree um, I felt like like you use the word panic and that's exactly what I felt when I was reading the pages that um, Chong drew in that period where she was knowing that her sight might be going away forever. And it just created a very visceral sense of chaos and I don't know what's happening. And then the pages she drew near the end of the book, um, which are still like, they're very abstract, but they kind of let go of that sense of trying to create something um, realistic, like it, it's it's almost like she lets go of trying to create images that are sighted and just is creating images that don't represent something one to one visually, but are still very evocative emotionally. You can just they feel more like movement through space than a static image on the page that's trying to capture um, 
like a hospital room or hands. It's more, this is an existence. This is my movement through the world now is much, much more free form and less, um, less uh, controlled. Yeah. I think letting go was, was the operative term that you just yeah. used. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's that, that whole idea of forgiveness that goes on towards the end as well. Um, she has a, that terrible relationship with Seth, her previous boyfriend, who is a man baby of the, the whatever. Oh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um, she needs to hear him say that he's sorry, but he can't get, she can't get that from him. So she has to use a stand in to get that apology. And somehow, that forgiveness, um, she says, freedom is forgiveness. Um, so that's a whole nother piece to this whole puzzle of this book. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I forgive him. <laughs> he's just, no. there's no, <laughs> he's such an awful person, just so selfish. Yeah, I just, uh, I, I raged about him uh, when I read this book. I just, it just, you know, and, and it's hard to know, it's hard to know how to feel because to a certain degree, she's using this, she's using this moment as a way to wrestle control back from a, from a situation that seems so uncontrollable. His, his reaction to her illness and his feelings of culpability or guilt about everything that's going on, um, she's trying to present that in a certain way, but then also like there's a point where she literally takes a, he brings her a hammer and she holds it to his head. Like she's going to hit him with it. And she's like, no, it's not worth it to kill you. Like, wait a minute. What, what is going on here? I'm, I'm so, what, like you, you, you know, like there's, it's this really dark moment and he's like a really dark essence that kind of, kind of is the, is a push and pull against her general feelings at the end of this very like bubbly, almost saccharine kind of life. So, you know, life is a highway, you know, kind of rascally flats kind of business. Like you can, you can do whatever you want, you know? And, and so I just, it's, it's, there's this really strange tonal um, contrast that he represents. Yeah. Uh, uh, before I talk about him, I wanted to go back to um, the collaboration with Georgia Weber. I thought it was an extremely interesting choice because if you've read Dumb, uh, Georgia Weber's other book, you'll see that um, she has an extremely fluid but controlled art style with a thick, uh, thick line, um, powerful, expressive, um, very deliberate, very controlled, um, one might say. And the choice of her to mesh with Chong's, you know, scratchy, panicked, I'm drawing this as fast as I can line was an interesting one. Um, and uh, I'd, you know, I'd be curious as to uh, how that came about other than the fact that they had something in common with regard to being cartoonists who went through this kind of, you know, debilitating experience, you know, at, certainly at different levels. Um, but what I thought it was interesting about Weber as, uh, as a craft person was the way she uh, subtly integrated aspects of Chong's style into her own, the color palette being the big one, this kind of, um, uh, you know, midnight blue colored pencil that is sort of the hallmark and what Chong is doing that kind of represents the blurring of light, things seem dark, um, is a constant, uh, you know, sometimes in subtle ways, sometimes just in like, you know, she shades Vivian's glasses with that blue. Then it shows up in more dramatic ways. Um, and then, you know, she's also very careful to mimic Chong's character design, things like that. But it's still a really striking transition because everything Weber does is still very controlled, very precise. Um, 
very deliberate. Um, and I, I wonder if that precision isn't something that contributes a little to the dissonance at the very end. If that last drawing that Chong did of playing the ukulele and whatnot was in Chong's hand and it was more scrawled, would we look at it slightly differently? I don't know, maybe. Um, but it's something to consider in the aesthetic presentation and it's not a coincidence that the most emotionally gripping part of the book is in Chong's hands. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the healing portion of the book as is depicted is in Weber's hand and the emotional effect is different. Yeah, I, one of the things that I think as you're kind of talking about this and, go, you know, talking about the interplay um, before we kind of dig into Seth a little bit more, I think yeah, what this for me shows is uh, Weber's um, skill as an illustrator and as a cartoonist, right? She's um, taking this, uh, it's almost uh, like a chameleon-like focus um, because I've read and enjoyed her work and it does not look like this. I mean, it, you know, it, it is very different, um, from a, from a design and aesthetic perspective. Now there are similarities, right? You definitely do see Weber as a, as a creator in this, but the way in which the material from Chong's, you know, uh, two week stint, um, after the transplant is integrated so effectively, sometimes it's hard to know what Weber has drawn and what she hasn't drawn in some of those pages, you know, and it's, there's a real blending of that, those materials. Sometimes it's a little more obvious, but sometimes it's not. So I thought, you know, I just think that in the sense that um, we're trying, you know, um, they're trying to create this amalgamation or this, this, something that is larger than the sum of its two parts. I think that Weber is a, a really fantastic collaborator in that sense, because I, um, she doesn't overwhelm the work with her own voice, I guess. Um, and I think that's really important for a, a narrative like this. Yeah, I definitely agree that um, as a collaborator, um, she gave everything she had to to adjust um regarding seth he's such an over-the-top character that it's almost like watching cringe comedy like an episode of curb your enthusiasm but he's just such an unrelentingly selfish bad person um but he's also interesting in that um, you know, he's clearly never had, you know, it's it said that he's a trust fund kid. Um, he's clearly been indulged constantly his entire life by everyone around him and has never had to bear the responsibility of anything he's done in his life. Um, and so when payment comes due on like this kind of shocking emotional abandonment, he is incapable of uh, simply saying, you know, I'm sorry. He never really says I'm sorry. He just says, I'm a bad person and I don't deserve to live, which is a deflection of someone who is completely unwilling to like even attempt to grow or learn or change. Um, it's, it's the hallmark. It's saying that my personality is reified and can never change and I am bad. It's someone who's like unwilling to do any work whatsoever ever on themselves, and um, and her attempting to like get something out of that is like blood from a stone. It's just not going to happen. Um, which is why her eventual course of like um, forgiving him through this kind of surrogate was so powerful because um, abusers never say they're sorry. And isn't Honestly, it, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jules. No, you go ahead. I was gonna say, isn't it interesting that she spends so much of her time 
in the book, reflecting on her personal experience and being meditative and self-reflective. And so in that sense, he is the dichotomous, you know, essence to her, um, not only creatively and just like as from his behavior standpoint, but just in terms of the way um, he's depicted as a unrelentingly self-centered, but not reflective person. He's very, he's like, this is how I am. And like you said, his personality is reified, you know, a great way to put it. What were you going to say, Jules? Seth was so cartoonishly awful um, that I, I tended to wonder if he was maybe more of a composite. Like if he was sort of a stand-in character for unfairness that she might have received from a lot of different people. Um, it, 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 Like Rob said, he was extremely over the top. But the fact that she portrays herself, you know, obviously a very self-reflective person, someone very in touch with what she's going through um for her to, for her character to be shown going back with Seth and, and you know having a nice jam session after all he's done to her really threw me and um made me think that maybe he doesn't necessarily have a direct real life um counterpart he he, he might just be a composite, right? And one of the interesting things is at the beginning of the book when she talks about how she and Seth got together was that she says something like, uh, he understands my need to express to create. So their initial attraction was one of creativity. And, and then it turns toxic when she gets sick, when she, when she can no longer be collaborative and actually needs him, that's when it all falls apart. Well, and certainly it's a representation of like, not all of our um, relationships in our lives uh, are all inclusive. And for him or for her, he represented this artistic outlet that was super powerful for her. So powerful that um, she even like let him come back into her life after what he had done initially because she was so isolated and unable to make art and even you know her other boy her boyfriend at the time tried to make as much time for her as possible but it was still she's had to spend so many hours alone and you know the lesson that she kind of learns is that he was valuable to her life in this one way and toxic in all other ways and when she, you know, when she let him back in and he was like still the same jerk he was before, it kind of like the candle was, you know, the, the light bulb went off. It was sort of like, oh yeah, now I remember. And it's like, and I can't make him be something other than he is. You know, when he brings his his current girlfriend to a concert and was like, why did you bring her here? He's like, I don't know. I thought he might have something in common. You know, so like, Explicitly unempathetic of circumstances that it was like again I almost hilarious um and it was at that point she kind of um that was actually a key turning point in the book because it was at that point she stopped depending on others for aesthetic um uh aesthetic meaning and um uh and joy and found ways to develop that in her by herself. Because prior to that, that she she wasn't able to do that. I wondered too when when she um like they had that jam session um at one point where her current boyfriend Michael tried to come by with food and she didn't hear him. And I wondered if in some ways, even though Seth was such an awful person, it was a relief to be around someone who um, wasn't treating her differently than she was treated before. Like he was so inconsiderate and just paid no attention to what had happened to her that it was almost like, um, 
someone where she didn't feel like a burden because everyone else was looking after her so much and she does seem to to um worry about how much she's depending on other people and then seth comes along and doesn't help her at all and you know it's just um he's the same he treats her the same whereas her interactions with everyone else have changed a lot that's such a great point and and thought of that and it's right it's like yeah he treats her like garbage with the exception of this one area where it's like you're my collaborator let's go and that's the one area in her life that had been completely missing of someone like saying not looking at her you know not caring about what was happening to her but caring it's like let's make art it was just that you know it was good for a while but that couldn't last in a sustained way and also so many of the caregivers that she had personal relationships in this book were kind of terrible to her as well i mean there was no point where anyone said let me help you out of the kindness of my heart. It's either obligation or you're doing it wrong kind of thing. I mean, even uh, Michael, her boyfriend says, you know, I, I can't do this anymore. We're like, I see you like almost like a sister now because I've had to take care of you and her mother as well. It was, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I mentioned that caretaker angle from um, her cancer year and uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, obviously the person going through this horrible experience is having this horrible experience that's very difficult to understand. Um, but how people around them act, react, um, you know, without getting support of their own um, is difficult. And it's clear that Michael was uh, pouring everything into this and then kind of realized I poured this other aspect of myself and it changed the way I felt. Um, and, uh, and with like the professional caregivers, sadly, not unusual for a lot of people, it's a paycheck and that's about it. And, and for in certain cases, you're lucky if they're not like openly hostile or abusive. Um, there's a shocking lack of training for a lot of people and I thought her depiction of that, you know, the positives and negatives. It was like, she was glad she had this human being to like help her do things and bring her around. But it was like, but she wasn't very nice. She was just doing a job and grateful for the job but not much else. Yeah. And that mirrors my experience in healthcare. You know, what, what personal aides and folks like that can be like now there are obviously folks that are not like that but you know when it when the only motivation is a paycheck you can end up like that mm -hmm. one of the things that i we talked about earlier that I wanted to kind of jump back to, and maybe when I say earlier, I think I mean, you know, in a previous iteration of this, um, is this idea of braveness, you know, um, and bravery as a, as a source of like something to reflect on in this narrative. Like your thoughts on that. Do you think that Vivian is brave? I think that's, it's an appellation I hate in graphic medicine narratives. I'm like openly hostile to it because I think it's, it's not relevant. Um, whether or not you die of cancer bravely or cowardly doesn't affect the narrative. Mm -hmm. It's like you still die of cancer. Um, uh, because it's like, you know, they had a uh, courageous battle against cancer that they succumbed to. And it's like, you know, were, were they carrying a flag? Were they, you know, blowing a trumpet? How, how, how did they display their courage? Uh, it's simply that this is a human story that you just, that you had to go through. Um, 
and um and i feel that way with her in that um while she was determined that's a good word um she tried to be optimistic um there are lots of portions of this book where she was scared um and you know it was it was very clear um and maybe the you know the, again with the ending where she's like here i am um uh i'm not even sure that even even with the dissonance of that i'm not sure the the, the motion that she's trying to put across more anything is bravery um there's just an essential she has this essential unrelenting optimism that she clings to um and she's definitely clings to it and uses it as a mantra um and calling it brave or cowardly is to me it's like beside the point yeah and i i think if you start to um get into discussions of bravery with things that people have to go through it kind of implies a judgment on people who might not be so optimistic who might not be able to maintain that um, upbeat mindset and I don't think there's anything better or worse about either attitude I mean if you're going through something you're going to go through it how how you can and I I don't think being more or less positive about it is better or worse. And when you say someone's brave for um, acting positive or for surviving, it's kind of an implied judgment if someone's not called brave. Yeah, Sarah, I love your point and Rob, yours as well. I, you know, this is, you know, uh, something that I've seen um, talked about in a bunch of different graphic memoir narratives um, or from, I'm sorry, graphic medicine uh, narratives. And it's something I wanted to address because I, I agree wholeheartedly. You know, it's not uh, one of the things I dislike very intensely is this idea of being a fighter against cancer or, you know, it's like uh, she was a fighter. It's like, well, you know, everybody wants to live, right? That's not, that's not a, you know, everybody has things that they care about, right? Like that doesn't, you know, it's not a, you know, you're not battling you're you're living you're trying to live that's that's more important than fighting or being brave this these concepts that we you're right sarah do pass some kind of judgment on people and i think that that's something i wanted to get get at with our conversation today one uh rob one of the things you brought up was this idea of optimism and determined uh, a sense of determinism but one of the things that I think that really strikes me about um, the narrative is how spiritual it is, not in the sense of like, like uh, a defined religion, right, or uh, religious discussion, but the use of uh, meditation and, and the use of um, introspection in a way reaches to certain, at certain points of an almost spiritual journey. And I was interested if anybody else got that same sense from this book. Making you think on this one. I mean, yeah, there's definitely some of that. Um, and that optimism was in the form of a meditative practice where she would say, I will get better. She closed her eyes, you know, she sat there, she thought these thoughts, I will get better, you know, and, you know, neurologically, when you look across different cultures and religions, um, people who use the practice of prayer in or meditation on a regular basis, um, regardless of how you're doing it or what you're doing it to, um, it tends to improve one, one's mental health. It tends to uh, reduce stress and anxiety, it tends to make it easier to deal with your day. And so 
um, you know, kind of sneakily and secretly and slyly while she's healing from these other aspects of her life, she's finding a way to heal mentally and emotionally by constantly invoking this meditative practice, you know, especially when things seem to be the worst. And she's not praying anyone in particular. She's just kind of visualized this thought, but the way she draws herself every time, and it's, it's in this very deliberate meditative way where she's even like calmed and, and centering herself. All the hallmarks of the meditative pose. Yeah, there is a uh, there is a sense of like a mantra there, isn't there? Like a I will like I will get better. I will see again. I will hear again. These are like these are at, like this the affirmative um, thought process is, is a key part of my reading of this book because it it shows you. I think more than anything else in this in this uh, narrative, I think that, that shows you who Chong is. Um, in a, in a way that's more revealing than perhaps anything else in the rest of the book. And I'd also argue that that affirmation is what allows her to go from the beginning of the book where she's reluctant to advocate for herself to one who is like adamantly advocating for herself in the end, like when she has her um, her assistant's dog saying, you know, you know, don't pet my dog. My dog is working. And when she, she brings him to a restaurant, and they're like, oh no, pets. It's like, um, this is this is my assistant dog. By law, you have to seat me. Um, and like I said, there's there seems to be a direct correlation between the meditative practice um, and optimism and her own self-advocacy. One of the things that I wanted to also talk about in this book is the, is the kind of the way that Chong and uh, Weber kind of address the really um, the physicality of dance. Um, there's a really striking page near the end of the book where you see uh, Chong in kind of like a yoga pose with all these lines surrounding her in this like blue. And it's just a very striking image, and I'm and I'm thinking about both these like these visual cues, but then also the 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 title of the book, which is Dancing After Ten. Um, and the emphasis that that art form has on the last half of the book. I was wondering if anyone had any thoughts about the way that Weber and Chong are using line at the end or the way that they're using this kind of connection to another art form as a way to kind of broaden the reader's experience of the work. Daniel, I'm looking at you. I know. I'm, I'm not really, I hadn't really thought about it too much. I mean, I, I, I was sort of, as you were talking, I was looking at the cover of the book and how um, this is, this is a progression, right? This is a dance as well. I mean, these, this is almost like a choreographed thing and it's enormously evocative of, of sort of a, a, a struggle here and then a triumph. Um, so I'm, I'm just trying to wrap my head around what you were saying and how, the, how this all works. So give me another few moments here. <laughs> Jules, Sarah, what are your thoughts? I mean, well, sequential art is movement. Um, you know, little panels in a series that evoke movement and the passage of time and the passage of space as opposed to um, one painting or one illustration which isn't always but can be much more static so I think the dancing the fact that um, she does this dance performance 
and wants to share it with more people, I think choosing to do it as uh, graphic memoirs, sequential art was kind of the logical way to go about sharing her, her um, dance performance, kind of bringing the movement into a static object. And another thing that's kind of interesting is both cartooning and dance requires the audience to be able to see as well. And so much of this is about the loss of her sight. And so I'm trying to figure out how that all integrates as well. But the, the, that seems to me that that's, that's, there's something kind of fundamental there, that those are the two art forms that she's choosing to express herself with in the absence of sight. I actually think dance has a lot less to do with sight than but, but for an audience, say. for an audience to to uh, experience it, yeah. Yeah. but, but I think for the performer, it's the performer doesn't have to be sighted to be a dancer, right? Which is but, relevant, right? Mm -hmm. Like she moved from cartooning to something she could do without being able to see or necessarily mm -hmm. hear. Um, but she also proved that a cartoonist doesn't need to be able to see either. Right. Not true. <laughs> I would I would argue that her best work in the book is when she's not sighted, like her most powerful and evocative illustrations or drawings are from when she's not able to see the page. That's so true. And I think thematically, it's why those drawings right before the very end seemed like such a powerful grace note because um, the fluidity in her line, um, feel like it feels like to tie ties in and it ties in everything from that to you know lost a bit of your mic there, Rob. I think your mic has gone out on us. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So what I was saying was that um, the uh, the theme of dancing going to uh, you know relating to the last few pages of the book where you have her drawings and they're so fluid and spontaneous and it almost really looks like again it's like it's like a dance it's uh, and it's, it's this very pure distillation of movement in just a few lines. And so it really seemed to thematically fit with the title of the book and um, with her own individual ability to create art on her own, not needing anyone else and all human tie in there. So again, that made the last couple of pages feel again, you know, aesthetically dissonant. Even if thematically she thought they were important for her own purposes, because clearly she did. Um, uh, it's just that, you know, there's, I, th I think in the end, there is a clash between thematic, um, between the actual narrative and the emotional narrative she was trying to tell. And that we, the readers seem to expect it to go one way and she veered off in a different direction um, because she wanted to, because she was, it was important. And again, it goes back to control it goes back to controlling her own image of um, uh, I'm a happy person and you can be happy too. And that's a, that's a, I think actually a fascinating place to end the conversation today because we're butting up right on an hour. Um, and so again, if you uh, are, if you joined us on YouTube or through SBX's um, recordings, we want to thank you for attending our panel on on uh, Vivian Chong and Georgia Weber's Dancing After 10, published by Fanographics in 2020. Um, this has been Enemies of the State. My name is Alex Hoffman. I'm the publisher of Solrad. Oh, I'm Sarah Miller from The Sequentialist. I'm sorry, I was muted. I'm Daniel Hilliken, <laughs> uh, editor of Florida. I'm Jules Beeks, freelance critic. And I'm Rob Cloud, uh, contributing editor to Solrad. 
Thank you so much for uh, attending today. Uh, next month for the podcast, we'll be discussing um, the two graphic novels, My Solo Exchange Diary, Volumes 1 and 2 by Nagata Kabi. So we're excited to talk about those. You can find us online at www.solrad.co or online at SoundCloud and wherever you get a po your podcasts. Thank you so much for spending the day with us and have a great rest of SBX.